Thank you so much for coming on this cold night. We really appreciate it. Um, we are very excited tonight to have a great all-star lineup here, the Escher Quartet with guitarist Jason B.O. Please give them a very warm welcome. And tonight we're going to have two wonderful, lush guitar quintets, um, the famous Baccarini Fandango Quintet, and one that you may not know, Castle Nuevo Tedesco's Guitar Quintet. And we actually have his complete papers and collection here at the library, so that's one of the things that we love to talk about with these guys who've been rehearsing this afternoon and it sounds beautiful. So I wanted to just jump right in and say, um, first, that uh, this is interesting to me because these two court quintets are written almost 150 years or maybe a little over 150 years apart, and people don't know why, really. Why do you think there's such a gap? It, it's this incredible sound. What, what, what caused that, do you think? Well, oh, I, I, can, I have a... I can hazard a guess, I guess. Uh, I think the advent of the piano, first uh, with the piano forte, and then the modernization of it um, eventually, I think really drove, began to drive the guitar a little underground. Guitar was actually really quite popular in, in Europe. And um, in Vienna, um, and uh, the, sort of the, the musical centers of Europe, and it would have been something that, you know, your daughter or your son would would practice or take up, you know, if, if, or harpsichord or something, you know, um, or flute or something, you know, this kind of thing. And there was that really uh, created a lot of uh, guitar repertoire uh, in the early 19th century, in particular. So we had um, really important figures and, and I mean, incredible musicians and composers like the Spaniard Fernando Sor, who took up residence in Paris and published all of his works there in Paris. Mauro Giuliani, uh, the Italian virtuoso, he was kind of, he was to the guitar at the same time that what, you know, what he would have been to the guitar, what Paganini mm -hmm. would be to the violin, played his own compositions. And he would, um, he, one of the, uh, w some of the well-known uh, guitar pieces from him are these things called Rossiniana. He wrote six six of them, and they're all like 15 minutes long, and they're basically like a Rossini jukebox <laughs> on guitar with like pyrotechnics in between and and this kind of thing. So, so people would come to you know just see this amazing person playing all this polyphonic music on the guitar, and Beethoven. He was friends with Beethoven and Hummel, and and a lot of the you know based in Vienna. And it, he had his own, there was a magazine called the Giuliani ad that uh, kind of detailed his, it was like a fan mag that uh, detailed his concert activity. So yeah, it was very robust until I, but I think in that after, I would say 1840, mm -hmm. it started to, to move into decline with the, with, with the, with piano repertoire and all, you know, really becoming very dominant. That's interesting, Adam. Did or did you guys have a follow up on that? Because I I I'm so pleased that, that this repertoire is coming up tonight. Um, we haven't had. Uh, I don't think we've had this guitar quintet by Casanova played here. I think, and I I remember reading something Jason you said about you guys tour madly. I know all of you nonstop, and I don't know how you have a chance to get together and rehearse. But you you said something like this one you don't play very often at all. You together well, well maybe we played it what 15 20 times yeah i think That's i mean like it, it, compared to the baccarini we don't play it nearly as much but yeah the baccarini is so so popular always so yeah I, I guess maybe one other possible reason um for for string instruments history has sort of been a process of playing for bigger and bigger audiences so the volume produced by string instruments has just gotten bigger and bigger and maybe there was just a, a disparity in the amount of volume that was being created. I mean, so now sometimes when we play with guitar, we he'll he'll use a bit of amplification mm -hmm. just to sort of even the scales a little bit. Um, so I I think maybe the guitar just didn't undergo the same transformation as an instrument that string instruments did. Yeah, that that happened later, really, when with the advent of uh, 
sort of the modern classical guitar, which was quite a bit larger than Fernando Sor's guitar, Mauro Giuliani's guitar. Uh, Torres is, you know, generally credited with kind of modernizing it, and that that would have been the guitar that Francisco Tarraga played, and then and Andres Segovia, and then Segovia championed uh, a German luthier, uh, Hermann Hauser, and those those uh, some of those original are are in the uh, is it the Metropolitan Museum, the uh, instrument collection. And uh, and so on and so forth, and then yeah, so the volume really began to improve, and and, and then with 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 figures like uh, Segovia, Andres Segovia, who his you know this piece Castel Castellano Tedesco was commissioned by Los Angeles Philharmonic, after and it was it was they wanted they had had Segovia as a soloist, and I think and I think he may have been playing the the first. Castle Tedesco, Tedesco Concerto, and so they they wanted to bring him back the next year, and this time they you know they said well they would like, they'd like to have a quintet with the symphony members, so that's how this piece was born. It's almost symphonic, and then it has beautiful intimate moments too, and the the violin interplay at, is really gorgeous at times. But it's easy to get just seduced. And the opening is kind of explosive, really. I wanted to ask you about the Segovia connection to Castle Nuovo Tedesco because I think he wrote something like thirty-five wow. pieces for Segovia. At least, yeah, uh, yeah. He wrote he wrote quite a bit for him, and um, and so yeah, they were very close for a long time. There was a couple other uh, composers that wrote a great deal uh, for Segovia that he championed, like the Mexican composer Manuel Ponce. And then some, uh, some other composers that were more, you know, maybe more orchestral or piano based, like uh, Turina uh, and Toraba. There's there's several. Um, I mean, lots that that Segovia was able to commission. Uh, and then I think Bream, Julian Bream, the English guitarist, later on really took up that mantle and had a lot of, you know, the the composers of the day: Benjamin Britten, William Walton, Toru Takamitsu. And, and sort of continuing that tradition, and that, and and so Segovia, and then that lineage, John Williams, Julian Bream, Sharon Isbin has done a great deal to bring uh, some of the the top composers, you know, writing concertos and chamber music for for guitar. Um, so, yeah. you know, you you sorry, you brought you brought the right guy on stage because uh, being at a library. Um, we all feel that Jason has a library of music in his brain. Uh, <laughs> so he is the man for the job. I, I used to. His days are over now. Well, just to have you guys jump in here. Thank what you. It, um, I know you play, of course, with many different kinds of uh, in in ensembles and uh, guest artists and so forth. Are there any challenges you feel about playing with a guitar? I was interested. Tonight, you'll see that there is amplification in a very modest and uh, simple way um, on the guitar. And in a hall as live as this, you don't need it so much. But what what do you? How do you feel about this? The quartet? well, I, I mean, typically with guitar, the and we already touched on that before. The, the most obvious issue is balance. So you have four sh four string instruments, um, which really project so well, especially in a beautiful room like this. So we do have to be generally very careful. The issue with Jason is... <laughs> Gosh, where do you even start? <laughs> is, <laughs> how much time do we have? No, um, uh, the issue with Jason is I think... The challenge for us is just um, always matching his unbelievable ability, and um, I, I I say that with all sincerity. Uh, we are we and of all the artists that we collaborate with and we have collaborated with over the 18 years in the quartet, uh, no one comes close to the amount of concerts we've played with that Jason. I mean, he's sort of an extension of the group at this point, um, and I think for us, it's it's just been a never-ending source of joy and inspiration, and um, so we wish there were more guitar quintets that we could bring forth to the public, and the Baccarini, as you'll hear tonight, we always close the program with the Baccarini, and we'll try our best to behave on stage, <laughs> but we really have a good time. And um, so if you see us smiling, it's not because we messed up. <laughs> well, we might have messed up, but... Uh... 
So, that, I mean, we don't actually, we don't normally play the Boccherini with amplification, um, but we have it here for the Castle Tedesco because it does, it does need it a little bit. You know, it helps, the, the guitar needs it. Um, but so we'll, we'll have it on stage. You know, it's such a, uh, I didn't know much about Castle Nova Tedesco, but I now know that he was a, a major film composer and you do hear that gorgeous film cinematographic sound in this. But I was thinking, I read uh, a comment in his, his granddaughter is somebody that the library is in touch with because we have his collection. So she had written an article or two and she's very pleased that you guys are playing this tonight. But she mentioned this quote, he said, it's a melodious and serene work, partly neoclassic and partly neo-romantic, like most of my works. And I was thinking, how could it be both? But it is. And I was wondering if you'd talk a little about that. He also felt it was written almost in a Schubertian vein with a few Spanish undertones. Yeah, well, I, I, I think you'll, you'll notice right from the very beginning um, sort of a couple melodies that just generally get passed from instrument to in in instrument, um, and the sort of surrounding harmony or texture changes. But um, there's really just a few melodies, very much like Schubert, where he sort of will repeat a melody, but have it surrounded by something else major or minor or different um, sort of dynamic texture. And so you'll just sort of hear that, uh, a modification of that melody. Um, Quite a bit, and there's there's in the third the first movement I think there's two or three major melodies, and every instrument gets to play it, and it's what how he surrounds it that is what creates the sort of the intrigue of the piece. So it's not just always new material; it's recycled material presented in a different way, um, which is very classical. Yeah, and the Schubertian thing is taking that's the same tune, and then by by either changing the harmony, or or, or either brightening it or darkening it you get a different character or different emotion like from the same material and that repetition you know is 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 that you'll you'll hear that throughout you know there he had also connections to Elizabeth Bray Coolidge who built our series our, our hall in our series but I hadn't known that she was involved with him so early even in 1929 before he left Italy um, he studied with Pizzetti and Alfredo Casella, and she knew both of them well. So he dedicated pieces to her and made a gift of some pieces to her. And she was very concerned, as so many people were, about having helping him leave Italy. Yeah. And I understand that he was assisted by Toscanini and Heifetz. Wow. Both of them. Didn't you, didn't you write he wrote a, a concerto? He wrote a violin us? concerto for he Heifetz that, that, that Heifetz yeah. played. Um, thinking about your touring and so forth, how do you make time to do new projects? I'm wondering for all of you, you you're so busy. You're doing a Bartok cycle now, aren't you? A major. That's a huge undertaking. Would you talk a little bit about that? It's coming up soon. Well, I, I think it's a combination of um, just our history as a quartet. We've played all of them multiple times, so in a way, a lot of it is sort of soaked in over the years. And then also just setting aside a week here and there or just a few days and just saying, oh, we better get together and do some rehearsal. So I, it's nothing complicated. It's just a matter of scheduling and um, just trying to make sure that we feel prepared. I, I think it's always, a, I mean, it's always a balance between, especially as the quartet has been playing together for longer. Yeah. I think we really make sure we prioritize our individual time much more than we did at the beginning. At the beginning, every day, we were rehearsing for four hours every day. Like it, we didn't take any time off of the whole year, and, and it's I, it's very different yeah. feeling in there. You have so many projects you do individually, and I was thinking before we circle back to the Baccarini, which is so beautiful, and I, I want to hear your thoughts about that. But if you wouldn't mind just saying something about your individual projects, I know you have been involved with Shuffle Along, and you have felt in four productions i'd love to hear oh about my that. goodness you did a deep dive on me yeah <laughs> um yes in in the past before i joined the quartet and and since i've joined the quartet um these extra projects of mine have, have become uh, less and less of a thing i have time to do and uh you know it's an interesting time to comment on what what adam said which is that in the beginning these two were the founders they rehearsed every day, and they know all of this rep. And my, this is my brother over here. He uh, joined the quartet almost a decade ago, 
and also had time to to rehearse uh, all that rep so for me it's like i'm uh, oftentimes getting onto a treadmill that's at level 10 <laughs> <laughs> when i join when i join rehearsals so uh, most of my most of my time is is taken up these days with with practicing the violin um but uh in New York, before I joined the quartet, I had a, a really, really strong intuition that young professionals uh, were a market that were really, really untargeted for classical music. Oftentimes, the folks that come to traditional series are a bit older, mm -hmm. and oftentimes, <laughs> I don't know that's quite how to that's phrase a joke. that. <laughs> and a lot not of like the time, it's not like this audience. <laughs> A lot of times, uh, the efforts that we make uh, in terms of outreach are for very young people, mm -hmm. and I just, I, I just had a feeling that um, packaging classical music great pieces in a certain way would attract audiences that were about my age, and, and I tried to make an event that I would want to go to on a Friday night as a 27-year-old back then in New York City, and some of them were quite successful, 500, 600 uh, people. Helps to helps to get a beer sponsorship. That's a big part of it. <laughs> but also presenting, I think, for the younger generation, presenting one piece, mm -hmm. one great piece. And my first, the first project that I did was actually the fourth string quartet of Bartok, um, which a lot of people see and they they run away from. But there's something about that music when it is at least explained or put in the right setting. Uh, I think. Uh, speaks to some kind of teenage you know rock and roll kind of uh, mentality and and one can can really get into it in fact after the first event that i did i had someone who had never been to a classical music concert come up to me a week later and say say um and this is such a funny reflection of how people consume music they said i went on spotify and i downloaded all of bartok's music <laughs> 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 and i took that as a major compliment so I know you both come from a musical family, and your father's a cellist, and um, you sometimes play together as a family, which is really cool. But I have a question for all of you, and for you, Pierre, because I think you teach at USM. SMU. Uh, it's Southern Methodist University in Dallas. Yeah, and, and tr as a teacher, for this is something for you particularly, but for all of you, given the world that we're talking about with every kind of digital uh, distribution of music and so on, and thinking about the fact that you've studied with some major artists through your whole career, what are the things that you teach think of teaching your students what not technique so much but what kind of precepts or ideas what do you think about these days i know that's a, a big one but well uh, when i teach I actually use a lot the social media to inspire the students the, for instance i my biggest influence even though i've never met the guy is william primrose he, he wrote a great possibly the greatest book about string technique uh, in the conjunction with his student David Dalton uh, on playing the viola but that that putting aside like you know he has, there's a lot of great tips in that so I try to uh, you know tell those things to my student and even better if they read it the book but like another thing that I, I try to do is like there's a lot of videos not so much visual of uh, William Primrose but like there's a lot of stuff and oftentimes they don't even know him like I, I start to to teach the student, and I'm always asking them, "Who's your idol? Who's the who's the violist you're trying to emulate?" And I'm shocked that they don't know him, 50% of the time. And I think we they should. We have some recordings here that I'll share with you. If you know. mm. But but yeah, I know Brooke, you're interested in great figures from the past as well. That's something. Well, I mean, I think what Pierre's getting at, um, as far as social media, why we just uh, the internet in general is that you, we, ha we have access to uh, an unbelievable amount of recorded material, a lot of it video recorded material, that, you know, even when I was a student, um, I would have to search through the Curtis Library and try and find a recording, maybe two that I could download onto my computer and then go home and listen to. Um, so it, it's such a great tool for teachers um, to show visually, not just in their own playing, but send their students home with 
homework to do and you go watch Heifetz play and look at his bow arm and see if that resonates anywhere. You know, go watch Chrysler play because it'd be com- something completely different, but you can watch and compare. And um, I, I think we, I know in my experience as a student, I learned so much from watching my teacher. Um, that was probably how I learned from him the most was the visual aspect of watching and hearing how he produces sound. Um, so there's just a, a wealth of information and material out there. We have um, time to, to really talk in depth about the Bac- Baccarini, which is such a fabulous piece. Um, and I would love to hear from all of you what you enjoy so much about it. And I, I think I'm curious. I read something about how he was a cellist. Baccarini was a cellist himself and wrote literally dozens and dozens and dozens of pieces, quintets and so forth. And we have that manuscript here, which um, I think is supposed to be on display later tonight. But I was curious um, about how you, uh, you mentioned the castanets. I can't resist asking you about that. But specifically a technical question. I read something about how he introduced thumb position for the cello. I have no idea what that is. Yeah, uh, I, you, you'll see pretty much the neck of the cello where we put our hands to play the notes. Once the neck reaches the body of the cello, the rest of the instrument, um, obviously you can only extend your fingers down the instrument so far um, with your thumb still located in the back of the neck. So bringing the thumb around and using it as a fifth finger um, but for the most part, before Baccarini, there was no music that was, or very little music that was written that required the cello to go that high. So he was he was such a virtuoso, way ahead of his time. Um, most of his employment was at the Spanish court. His in, his patron, the king, was a cellist. He was an amateur cellist. So he wrote over a hundred cello quintets, multiple concertos, sonatas, um, many of which he played with his patron. Um, but he was he was just like Paganini. He was so far ahead of his time, um, and so he really started one of the first schools of virtuosic cello playing. So thumb position you'll see is literally I just you bring up your thumb and it acts as a anchor and as a fifth finger. What about the textures? Incredible textures and layers. If each of you would talk about your favorite ideas about. Oh, by the way, they have an incredible record, a dance record. So this is 18th century music, dance music. Talk about that aspect. Well, I, th- I mean, I think the the movement, the third movement, which is what where the piece gets its title, Fandango, is is basically just an alternation between two chords. So it's it's very simple. It's basically like rock and roll. It's just like five one five one five one, and then he just he does so many creative, crazy textural things that are just so much fun to for us to play and enjoy and i think that it's almost the closest we kind of get to be rock and roll musicians <laughs> of just doing these kind of ridiculous things like like suddenly just out of nowhere and it's it's very unexpected in in this early of music like maybe if this was a contemporary piece you would expect sort of these banging like crazy moments but it's very early music and it's it's Comparatively, and it's just very unexpected. So that's really it, re- fun. it reminds me a bit of um, uh, the Ravel piece, one of my the, the famous Bolero, the Bolero, um, which I love. Um, it gets it gets uh, a bad rap these days because you hear it every other tune on the you know local classical music station, um, and also people hear it for the first time and they say it's just the same theme over and over again, but it starts. And by the end, it is just so out of control. And the journey from the beginning to the out of control uh, part of it is just, you know, that's the experience. And in the Fandango, we kind of get to do, get to do a bit of that. And plus, at certain points, we sound like mariachi violins too, which is kind of fun. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's more concerned with rhythm and texture, you know, like the best rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> But um, I, I think that you mentioned uh, there will be castanets at some moment. Oh, like don't give away the surprise. <laughs> no, yes, there, there, there will be. And um, 
go. Well, you'll 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 know when they come. I can promise you. <laughs> I get paid double for that, by the way. It's double scale. You know, you, Jason. I was making notes about your comments about Bach, and we have a nice chance to hear a solo set um, from Jason tonight too, which will include one Bach piece. Um, but you were, you said about your own recording, it's nice to hear what I was doing at the time with the ornamentation and how my Bach playing is less stiff, stuffy on this record. It's, and I love that. I, I think this that's... applies to this whole performance you guys are talking about. Uh, I think as you get older, you, I, if you've been playing, I mean, I've been playing and studying Bach since I was about uh, 10 or 11. And, and, I think that's some, that was maybe an interview or something where I, was make, uh, where I was asked to make a comparison between the previous Bach recording that I did in 2009, uh, which was lute works, and this one, which is primarily violin works, but also with the uh, third violin partita, which is the same piece as the fourth lute suite. It sort of completes the lute cycle. Um, yeah, I just... I mean, I guess if over 10 years had gone by and you just do a lot of performing. And yeah, I think it's, I, I think in comparison to that other record, maybe it's a little more dancey, like a little, a little less, um, it's looser in a good way. You know? And this whole evening really has such a, a wonderful dance feeling about it. I mean, and, and non stuffy too. Mm. Yeah, I, I don't think Haydn is ever stuffy. Haydn is always uh, some of the most creative or joyous or fun music to play and to listen to. So um, Instinctive. He's like a, a very gut-based composer. Ab absolutely, and, and f always full of surprises. Um, and that's what makes it so intriguing to play and oftentimes so difficult to rehearse because it should sound like the most, in a way, kind of very primal, natural reaction um, to whatever harmony or texture is presented. But it requires very studious effort. Um, but you have to be careful that it doesn't sound like that. Um, so, and it, it's just a never-ending challenge. And it, uh, it practically feels never-ending because he wrote over 68 quartets. Um, so it would take a while <laughs> to get through all of them anyway. So we, uh, there's... All the years I've played in the quartet, and I think my colleagues would probably agree, um, nothing beats opening a program than playing Haydn. It just sets the stage for anything to come. And you can play Castle Nuovo Tedesco right after it, or you can play a Bartok Quartet, or anything else in between. And it just always prepares the listener for anything to come. Uh, and that is, that is the gift of Haydn. I was wondering too, how do you, what what are you thinking about in terms of the future of quartets? Obviously, quartets are amazing. The people thought they would slim down or peter out or whatever, you know, a few years ago. They're stronger than ever. There are more young quartets. There are more people that you're teaching and so on. Uh, what do you see as the future for this kind of work? Well, I. I I guess um, just to sort of go back to what Brendan was saying earlier about speaking to different audiences, I one of the things that I really love about uh, chamber music, and I guess quartet is a very good example of that, is first of all how transportable we are. We can easily go anywhere in any setting. Um, we can play on a street corner, which we have done. Um, we can play in the sub. You know, we can play anywhere and it's basically the exact same experience mm. that people can have as they would have in this hall tonight, a beautiful hall. And I also think that for audiences, when they can get close to us and hear so much of the actual sounds, like the, the surface sounds of the violin or like the more immediate sounds, I think that makes a very visceral impact yeah. on people in a way that maybe going to an orchestra concert can't. I think that's a very different type of impact, and I think more people are exposed to that, and maybe not as have not been exposed to the very small room and just like getting blasted with Bartok quartets. I, and I think that that is a way that we can really engage new audiences 
And so I see that as, as really the power of chair music and the, maybe the potential of all of these quartets that have formed, you know, more quartets than have ever existed probably in history that are going out and a lot of them doing a lot of things locally and engaging communities. And hopefully that will build a new audience uh, for that is especially attuned to chamber music. It's amazing to me. Each year we meet new ones, and we have a specialty in quartets here. So I was just interested in that. And I was thinking maybe a few questions from the audience before we have to, to let these uh, folks go. Um, okay? So my question is, did you just say there were 100 guitar quintets? No, uh, 100 cello quintets. Cello quintets, okay. Yeah. He wrote six guitar. There's six. He, there's right. six guitar quartets. So, yeah. what, which of the others should we really fall in love with just as much as the Fandango? Oh, I, I, the second one is arguably the finest. I think is a composition. Number two, four is really popular with you know in programming and audiences because really because of the Fandango. But if if, if you're interested in that and want to go a little further, I would then then go to the second one. Another question? So any couple final thoughts? We want to we want to send them off so that they have a chance to warm up and so forth. Any, any final thoughts about being at the library? Being a, oh, one thing for you. If, would you mind explaining a little about the name of your quartet? Because I know you're yeah you're interested in the background on that. Oh sure. Um, well. I guess the first disclaimer is that you have to name a quartet, so it's always going to be slightly arbitrary because they're just, I don't know, it's just going to be a name. But anyway, when we started the quartet, we were we went through you know probably 100 terrible names. And my father, at one point, he, um, he was a physics professor. He's retired. But he had given me this book, Gödel Escher Bach, which was a pretty kind of a famous book in a certain time period. Anyway, so I sort of slogged my way through about half of that book, which actually, I don't think I've ever met anyone who has read the entire book. <laughs> I'm but sure there's someone in this room. There might be. Has. <laughs> but every, whenever I mention this story, a lot of people know the book, and they're like, oh, I read about half of that. Yeah. So it's a very common thread. When we started the quartet, I was thinking of, of all the things that resonated from that book. There is this sort of... Um, one of the focuses, I guess, is how all of them used sort of a form of counterpoint, I guess you would call it, like in box music, fugues, where everything, where each part plays the same thing, but then it's very, it takes different turns and different twists. And, and in Escher's artwork, the sort of the same thing is accomplished through, um, what is it called when he does the shapes? Tessellation, thank you. So like when, with the tessellations where he just repeats a figure over and over again and sometimes varies it in certain ways. So I just thought that that was a nice um, analogy for sort of how we combine in the string quartet with four separate parts and then creating this more interesting whole than just what one of us could do by ourselves. And it's an amazing uh, effect that you have. It, wait till you hear it tonight. It, you're in for a treat. And thank you so much, Jason Bio, Adam Barnett Hart, Brendan Speltz, Pierre Lapointe, and Brooke Speltz. Okay, can I thank can you. I just make one more comment? Oh, because course. because you mentioned it uh, about how we feel about being here. These, these guys have already played here, and this is my first time. My and first time too. Yeah. For, for you too, Jay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> just so many countless. Uh, countless amount of legendary performers and pieces have been performed here and premiered here and the name Coolidge on the auditorium. For me, this is, is one of those moments. It's one of those dream come true moments. So that's, that's how important this place is. And thank you for having us. Thank you.